I'm Samantha Engel. And I'm Aaron Gullius, and this is Great Lakes Lore. How's it going? Okay. I'm not feeling great, but I'm here, <laughs> and the sun is uh, still shining, and um, we are going to talk about some fun stuff today. Yeah. I mean, everything is blooming, like the lilacs and the apple blossoms. Like when you step outside, it just smells like, <laughs> right. like yeah. a nature candy store. Or yes, something. it does. <laughs> yes, it does. And then, then, then my allergies all <laughs> kick yeah. in. Yeah. Mine weirdly of... haven't been too bad this year. Usually I get some spring problems, but I've been weirdly okay. And that concerns me. <laughs> that yeah. There's something yeah, it's, big coming. <laughs> it's coming. It's, it's going to, June's going to hit and you're going to, it's just right? going to be hay fever hell. Yes. <laughs> but all right. So we are here to talk about a club, a s- not totally secret society. It was in the newspapers. So right, secret society yeah. doesn't quite fit. But we thought that a conversation about sort of secret societies and how, you know, we became interested in them or or whatever throughout our lives would would be a fitting way to start the discussion um, because we originally – I originally was trying to find a secret society in Chicago to research, and this is what popped up. And it was so (laughs) fascinating that um, I said, we have to do this. And so secret society or not, this is this is where we're at. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it is. So, Sam, what is your what is your history with secret societies? <laughs> Which ones do you belong to that you can tell us about? Um, well, unfortunately, I don't belong to any, but I was, you know, roughly a teenager ish when the History Channel was obsessed with the Freemasons. This is, I feel like this is pre ancient aliens. Like they had the whole Illuminati, um, uh, uh, Freemasons, that whole thing. Um, Spurred, of course, by Dan Brown, which I devoured the Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons and and all of that kind of stuff, too. Did you ever read Digital Fortress? No. That one's terrible. That's the only one I've read is Digital (laughs) Fortress. I read it for that Bad Books podcast I listened to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, No, I did not. I have not read that. That one didn't speak to my love of history mysteries. It's not good. It's not good. (laughs) No. What about you? I I have a – this won't surprise listeners probably. I have a pretty extensive – past looking at at secret societies that goes back to actually college and and getting into uh, getting into conspiracy theories and conspiracy culture because mm. secret societies are all over there we've got the freemasons we've got the illuminati at uh, at the top of it and all sorts of other little groups i think my favorite one was the the committee of 300 <laughs> which apparently controls uh controls everything even though we we both know the lizard people control everything <laughs> the shape-shifting lizard people control everything but secret societies have, have always been you know fascinating to me and the, mm-hmm. the the theories that that surround them and just um earlier today i was rereading the chapter of my book on conspiracy theories about secret societies and it was like <laughs> oh yeah i remember it's all a lot of enlightenment stuff and sort of sort of secret enlightenment clubs in places like uh pre-revolutionary france and mm-hmm. uh the holy roman empire where talk of democracy and religious freedom would not make you popular so <laughs> these are these are groups that actually were promoting things that would uh, sort of speak to enlightenment values rather than being evil bad guys wanting to put us all into camps. Yeah. And I think I was fascinated by them in part, well, because I was always interested in like religious history and stuff like that. So I was a religious studies minor in college. And so connections to or issues with the church, which both depending on like which which way you approach it, you know, those are those are all over there. And so I think that always fascinated me quite a bit. And I was always skeptical of 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 big, big powerful things. <laughs> and so um so for some reason the secret societies I found interesting, like, well what is what is the tie with all of this and what are those Freemasons actually doing and 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 all of that. Is is Washington D.C. really planned as some Freemason design? <laughs> it is, but it doesn't matter. Well, I know that's, that's yes. sort of how I see. Yes. That's how I see a lot of this, like the symbolism on the the thing with the owls. Like, yeah, people in the secret club put their little tag everywhere. You know, right, right. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't mean that you know walking through the Denver airport, you know, initiates you into some sort of cult, <laughs> um, or maybe it does. I don't know. So. 
when we think about secret societies, there are there are big things like you know the Freemasons. There are smaller things. There are lodges. My grandpa was a member of the Moose Lodge. I'm mm. pretty sure he Oddfellows. did. Oddfellows. I like odd, Oddfellows. I'll, I'll just say the Oddfellows. There was one um, that I, I read about once called the Order of Pythias, which which mm-hmm. sounded really kind of uh, kind of creepy. But in a lot of cases, these were social groups, uh, professional networking groups mm-hmm. that uh, that had sort of vague ideological purposes, but mostly. Um, those purposes were the promotion of good or the, mm-hmm. the promotion of, of the higher learning or, or something mm-hmm. you know fairly fairly vague. There's rituals because rituals are fun and rituals are uniting. And if you have this sort of secret ritual or learning or knowledge that you share with these other members of the club, then you've got some connection to them. So there's all sorts of societies that have secrets and when you reverse the words and call them secret societies, it sounds a lot more sinister uh, than just like a club that has secrets. You know, my Boy Scout troop had rituals. It <laughs> doesn't mean we were a sinister secret society. But did it? <laughs> well, kind of. Um, they played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons in the Boy Scouts. <laughs> at least, at least my troop did. Um, so, alongside this secret societies or lodge type groups, there were also other organizations that had been forming during the 19th century and became really popular around the Gilded Age. Even if we look prior to that, though, I know you already sort of mentioned things that were taking place in um, revolutionary France, you know, the formation of those clubs and stuff. But when I was still in my PhD program and conceiving of ideas for my dissertation, I was interested in the um, history of education. And I wanted to study the formation of learning societies in the early republic. So it was this idea, again, of sort of middle working class to upper class guys get it because they had to be guys, (laughs) of course, getting together and reading. And, you know, they would have perhaps little libraries, maybe it truly be a reading circle. You'd discuss some of these big ideas. And so you can see, I think, some of the early roots of even just these smaller little clubs like we are going to be talking about in, you know, the the very early 19th century, which is where I always feel far more at home. <laughs> <laughs> but specifically during the Gilded Age, um, so Gilded Age refers to, you know, as we've mentioned many times, but I think it's important to remind ourselves of what it is, um, the later couple of decades um, of the 19th century, the 1800s. And um, the term Gilded Age was coined by Mark Twain to describe um, a society that looked beautiful and shiny and golden on the outside, but inside had a lot of problems. Um, and so this is this is the time frame that we're looking at. We look at the Gilded Age a lot in this podcast. We do. We do. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's rife a- with with things that we talk about. It's it's a, it's a creepy time period. So it's a period of ferment. See, and you know, in, in high school and even college, I hated this time period, but that's because we didn't talk about the creepy stuff enough. So, (laughs) but, but so anyways, during the Gilded Age, there was a surge in clubs for professional men in cities around the United States. Often, but not always, these were centered around specific professions. So we really see the professionalization of America and and a lot of these different um, jobs, whether it's the training and certification and then the network that these folks make. um, We see that at this time period. But an article in the July 1889 issue of Cosmopolitan entitled The Clubs of Chicago sums up the perceived value of club culture to American society. Club life is undoubtedly civilizing. It exerts a restraining influence. The healthy effects of dignified surroundings upon the man careless of engagements and proprieties are far-reaching. In not a few cases, this restraint has elevated the whole social tone of new settlements, such as Denver and Cheyenne. Although life in clubs offers many temptations, these are more than counterbalanced by the discipline consequent upon the necessary observances of regulations established by and for the gentlemen. This is especially noticeable in Chicago. The article goes on to explain that since the rise of club life in the city, there had been a marked improvement in the morals and manners of the younger men. It's also important to remember that during the 1880s and 90s, Chicago was growing quite a bit. Um, You know, it had a a later birth, a later start than the major cities along the 
East Coast. But if we think about the uh, Columbian Exposition in 1892, so the World's Fair of 1892, all of these cities had to compete to host it. And Chicago ends up winning. So clearly there was, you know, everybody saw the potential in Chicago. They saw its location as being really ideal. Um, It's located, of course, on the Great Lakes. It's kind of in in the middle of things and a bunch of rail lines came through there. Um, And so Chicago really had a lot going for it. And, you know, there were more people in the city. And with more people, there were more jobs and more men needing clubs. <laughs> That's right. And the secret society or, or really club we're going to be discussing today is the Whitechapel Club, named after, yes, that Whitechapel, the London neighborhood where Jack the Ripper um, ripped and <laughs> murdered young women. The club was established during the summer of 1889 in the back room of Coaster's Saloon in Chicago's Press District. And some of the early members were former members of the Chicago Press Club, which was the largest, most prestigious club for journalists in Chicago. And they had left that organization. And those who had transferred their loyalty to the Whitechapel Club tended to be younger and might have found the more affordable dues of the Whitechapel Club preferable to the more expensive Chicago Press Club. So they were younger men. They wanted something a little cheaper. And as we're going to see, a little more seedy seedy, I was going to say frivolous, um, (laughs) freewheeling, fun, things like that. So according to the Munster, Indiana Times, uh, December 5th, 1911, sort of looking back at the club, they explained that the club began at the time of the murder of Dr. Cronin. Dr. Patrick Henry Cronin was an Irish-born medical doctor in Chicago and a member of the Clan Nagale, an Irish Republican organization. Now, Cronin had criticized the leadership of the group and was accused of being a spy for the British government and kicked out because an Irish Republican group, it's basically Irish nationalism, that sort of thing. So if you are accused of being a British infiltrator into this group, that's that's pretty bad. He is murdered in May of 1889 by other members of the group, and the trial of his murderers was one of the most sensational of the time. Um, I read that the crowds gathered for the trial Uh, were the largest crowds in Chicago since Lincoln's funeral train had gone through. So this was a a big event. And after their conviction, there was a backlash in the city against secret societies with protest meetings and benefit concerts being held to push for the city of Chicago to outlaw any secret club. Now, many prominent men, the newspaper said, were entertained at the club, and the club was famed for its wit and satire. And it did have a more sort of literary bent than organizations like the more formal press club. A 1915 article in Scoop magazine described its members as wild and erratic geniuses and that the club was young with hope and it was bizarre, (laughs) which I just love. Although the the, the club's bylaws allowed for a maximum of 51 members, um, according to people who've looked at what records still exist, there were never more than any 40 members at any one time. The key qualifications for membership were wit and good fellowship, and new members were encouraged strongly to spend five days a week during their probationary month in the club, getting to know fellow members and getting pranked, insulted, and otherwise hazed. New candidates' names were posted on a bulletin board in the club, and at any time, a regular member could remove one of those probationary members' names, and that person would be out and would, you know, you're out, you know, just sort of blackballed immediately. Yeah. So, what exactly was it that? this club was all about. Um, They mostly drank and shared newspaper industry gossip, usually between midnight and 3 a.m., though sometimes much later, as as you'll see. (laughs) People were there most days with full meetings regularly. They also had events like lie-telling contests with the man who told what was judged to be the biggest lie given the honor of wearing a huge Knights Templar sword that some said had been used to commit a murder in Louisville. Others remembered that a West Side Chicago teamster had decapitated his wife with it. So <laughs> conflicting stories, but whatever it was, it was used for murder. <laughs> One of the hallmarks of the club was the way that members would openly ridicule and insult anyone who was speaking to the group. They called this heckling sharpshooting. One person who visited the club said that the jester spared nobody and that the Whitechapel Club was not a suitable place for thin-skinned gentlemen. 
not probably a place I'd be frequenting, to be quite no. honest. <laughs> no, it's, it sounds mean. I'm not. I'm not good with <laughs> with heckling. No, no. I'm I'm a sensitive girl. <laughs> I am. I am. Oh, I'm not. A, I, was, I am. I'm a sensitive girl too. <laughs> but no, I I do not. I absolutely do not want to be heckled. That's all there is to it. So we actually were able to find quite a few newspaper accounts of of the club, though many are quite lurid, and I think we kind of have to wonder if they're a bit exaggerated, but this <laughs> this is what we found. <laughs> um, a February 28th, 1890 article from the Chicago Tribune titled A Night in the Whitechapel Club um, had had some of this to say. Inside, one finds all the weird horrors that took their birth in the odorous slums of Whitechapel. Comparing it, of course, to <laughs> that poor London area where, as we said, Jack the Ripper killed the ladies. It also reported that there were skulls of murderers on the table, and out of them, the White Chapelians, White Chapelians, White 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 Chapelians. We're going to go white chapel. White chapelians, white, sure. Yeah, yeah. It depends on how many syllables you want to put in there. <laughs> Anyways, out of the skulls, the, the members drink buoyant punches. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of description about the way the room is decorated, though, with items from crimes like a noose and handcuffs. And then um, this quote read, for it must be admitted that the white chapel man drinks now and again. The punch is brewed in a Japanese bowl that fancies forth the old goddess of death. And then it is turned out, the punch, of course, into skulls fashioned as cups. The king cup of them all is made from the cranium of bad Charlie. A few years ago, he was lynched in Wyoming. So, drinking out of skulls. That's right. <laughs> it then included the agenda for how the meetings go. And in a lot of details, but we'll just kind of summarize this for you. First, roll is called. The president, it is said, stands in the corner, but is just a life-size effigy of Jack the Ripper. <laughs> they call in the king's taster to drink the punch to prove it isn't poisoned. They drink in honor of their president, Jack the Ripper. They then tell stories, and there is a reference to orgies in this article, but dark stories about things like knives and murder and all kinds of crazy things these, these folks take turns sharing. <laughs> and this all continues on until 5 a.m. And the meetings occur once a month. But as Aaron said um, already, you know, people are encouraged to be there many days out of the week. This is just the formal meeting schedule. <laughs> there was another article in which a gentleman traveled to Chicago, listed many of the things that he saw. And one of those things was the goings on of the Whitechapel Club. Now, the one article that I used to take this information from was printed in the Buffalo Courier on April 5th, 1891, but it popped up in many newspapers throughout the country. Um, so clearly a popular thing to run at the time. Um, the description of the club pr was presented as cheery with the same comments about skeletons and grim decor. But it's cheery, you know. <laughs> bright and cheery. Yeah. Yes. Bright and cheery skeletons hang up wherever the pleased eyes ramble o'er the walls. And blood-spattered garments torn by the coroner from murdered innocence <laughs> soften the harsh outlines of the bony decorations. So I'm picturing, like, the skeleton... With like his his old uh, ratty pirate clothes on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, like these types yeah, of skeletons yeah. all over the walls. <laughs> yeah, very sort of theatrical, spooky skeletons yes, rather yes. than anatomical. Things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it also says that there were ghost dance garments from wounded knee upon which the blood yet looks nice and fresh. Oh, that's that's not good. No. That that's um, no. There's a whole list of many of the relics that were there from earlier crimes. The Whitechapel Club of Chicago was endowed some two years ago by Jack the Ripper for the purpose of engendering a more fraternal feeling toward humanity and also to advance intellectual refinement and to encourage thought waves. Realizing the uncertainty of life, he desired, he said, to perpetuate his name in this way. So this article is clearly very tongue in cheek very much poking fun at this club and the things that had already come out about this club. And and basically, you know, Jack the Ripper is the one who started and created <laughs> this club, right? <laughs> according sort of to this, this article. <laughs> this, this legend. Yeah. Yes. There was also a message from Jack the Ripper to the leadership of the club. Do all that you can to make the club cheerful and bright. I send by this steamer a gray plaid shawl stiff with the gore of number three. It will make a nice piano cover, I think. So there's this <laughs> sort of joke about, you know, the piano cover. Oh, yeah, that was um, victim number three of, of Jack. He, he thought it'd be nice and mm -hmm. cheery. And cheery. Mm -hmm. 
not not really in good taste. No. So Eric Larson, in his book, The Devil in the White City, tells the story of how the Whitechapel Club engaged in some good-natured but morbid banter with Chicago's rival to host the World's Fair. The New York effort was led by Chauncey Depew, and Depew had told the members of the Whitechapel Club that if Chicago beat New York for the privilege of hosting the World's Fair, he would, quote, present himself at the club's meeting to be hacked apart by the Ripper himself. <laughs> As soon as the selection was made, telegrams flashed back and forth. Within 20 minutes of Chicago being chosen, Depew received a telegram from the club reading, When may we see you at our dissecting table? Evidently a man of his word, Depew sent a message back. I am at your service when ordered and quite ready after today's events to contribute my body to Chicago science. So the the fame of the club had spread. You know, people like Chauncey Depew, who was a, a New York City guy, knew about the club and was joking around with them. And a lot of the stories, like like we've seen, they're not in Chicago papers. There are newspapers from all over the country, uh, even at the uh, the time, the contemporary time that the uh, the club was in existence. And one of the most interesting and exciting was the interview with Omin, who was a belly dancer, and she exposed the club in. 1893. So belly dancing was new and very exotic at the time. Some scholars of belly dancing say that one of the most well-known figures associated with and one of the earliest was this woman named Omin, who was born in Egypt. She had come to the U.S. from London in 1889, accompanying a Japanese stage magician named Yank Ho, who was actually not Japanese, but an Italian guy named Ercole Castagnon. So you have this Italian pretending to be a Japanese stage musician who brings with him his assistant who is a belly dancer, and that's how this belly dancer comes to the United States. Although largely forgotten now, Omin was a regular figure in gossip columns during the 1890s, leaving a trail of scandalous love affairs in her wake. One young man who fell in love with her, he was a newspaper reporter actually, killed himself when she went back to Yanko slash Ercole Castagnon after mm-hmm. their affair. So Amin's encounter with the Whitechapel Club was reported in the June 10th, 1893 edition of the San Francisco Call. A reporter visited Omin and noticed a small vase on a table. She decided somewhat reluctantly to tell him about it. And the way they write up her dialogue is just is just delicious. <laughs> oh, thereby hangs a tale which I never tell anyone, but I value that vase very much. I am very what you call superstitious, you know? And I am sure that if I lose that vase or anything should happen to it, I should meet with some great misfortune. Oh, it makes me shudder to think of it. It was so dreadful. Well, since you insist, I'll tell you. <laughs> but it seems such a dreadful thing for a woman to do. Oh, I'll relate it to you, but will you will you not take a cigarette? They're Turkish and very good. I'll smoke one too. I do so love my cigarettes. And so it's just this <laughs> sort of you're you're just imagining this woman sort of sort of waxing on waxing on about her hand Turkish gestures. Thing. Yeah. Yes. She's wearing something flowy. I'm sure the cigarette is in a long holder of it some kind. It better be. You know, those those, Turk, those Turk, Turkish cigarettes. <laughs> uh, Omin goes on to tell the reporter that she was the first woman to be allowed inside the Whitechapel Club. and They wanted her to dance for them, which she did. But she was horrified by the surroundings. Oh, it was horrible. The whole furniture was coffins. I shall never forget it. I did so wish I had not come. The room I was ushered into was not only furnished with coffins, but the walls were covered with frightful souvenirs of murdered men, ropes with which the existence of murderers had been terminated, blood-stained knives adorned the walls, the instruments used by the Chicago dynamiters were also there, and many relics of Indian massacres. It was, in fact, a regular chamber of horrors, far worse indeed than anything I have witnessed before. But I must tell you the worst is yet to come. I had not only to sit down on a coffin, but the table was made of coffins also, and the flowers were placed in the heads of the dead men. Skulls, I suppose. Yes, skulls. There was nothing but skulls and bones and coffins. Diablo! (laughs) She just yelled Diablo for no reason, so so did I. When I had to drink wine from the skull of a dead man, I felt quite overcome. Yeah, I don't think I'd do that. No, I probably, once I was certain it was an actual real skull, I'd, I'd, I'd be out. I would not stay for that. Yeah. So the article closes with Omin revealing that she had to promise the club she would never tell the story in Chicago and that the reporter was the first person she had ever told, which I I somehow doubt. But (laughs) what was in the vase? We're going to come back to that after the break. (laughs) 
Next time on Great Lakes Lore, we're going to be talking about swamp gas. <laughs> yes, and a little bit more than swamp gas, but only it's swamp gas. Mo- oh, okay, just just swamp <laughs> gas, folks. Literal uh, swamp gas, Aaron. <laughs> if, if you were expecting a uh, massive, epic changing UFO flap, you're going to be disappointed because there's nothing but swamp gas. Lots of science and methane. <laughs> yep, absolutely. But no, no cows around though, which is the usual source of methane. But we'll see. What I feel like that's coming up out of the swamp as things decompose. We do lots of swamps here in the show, don't we? Very, we do. Very swampy show. Yeah. Or, I mean, well, well, I'm a swamp Sally, so that, that's that's true. I'm just drawn that, to the swamp. <laughs> that's that's true. Um, you can take the girl out of the swamp. You can't take the swamp out of the girl. <laughs> You can follow Great Lakes Lore on Twitter and Instagram at Great Lakes Lore. We are on Facebook as the Great Lakes Lore Podcast. And you can email us at Great Lakes Lore Podcast at gmail.com. You can find past episodes in your podcast app or past episodes with photos and extensive show notes and everything at our website, greatlakeslore.com, where you can also find out more about us and uh, find out how you can book us to speak for your event, which is you should totally do. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, you yeah. totally want us. Yeah. Um, you can also check out our Patreon. Um, we are it's at uh, patreon.com slash Chizo Media. Uh, it is a Patreon for both uh, Great Lakes Lore and Aaron's other podcast, The Saucer Life. And there we have early access to episodes, blogs about our research, some special bonus episodes, and um, all kinds of goodies at two different tier levels. So if you're interested, you can check that out and see if any of them are right for you. And now, what we're going to do is we're just going to update you a little bit on some of the movie casting ideas <laughs> inspired by our, our episode about the Rattle Run murders uh, last time. And I think if we were sort of talking before we recorded about if we actually remembered what we suggested, but we, we knew that the, the one guy was going to be Bill Pullman. Yeah, that was going to be, yes. The, the the preacher. Yes. And and for the evil, mesmerizing victim of the horrible murder I'm, maybe evil was the wrong word there but um it's a lot of evil to go around i said daniel day lewis sam you said hamish linkladder hamish linkladder from midnight mass and presumably other things yeah so one question that we left unresolved was who should play the sheriff and i was standing in rite aid when <laughs> i got a text and sam you had the perfect casting hugh jackman Hugh Jackman. As as soon as you said that, I was like, "Yep." Because every is. also every woman will watch a movie with Hugh Jackman. That's pretty it. much true. It's it's been a fact in my life since I was probably 15 years old. <laughs> 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 what he's Wolverine sold, sold on everything else he ever does. <laughs> That's right. We had uh we had some some comments from uh from listeners. Uh one listener on the Patreon said um Bill Pullman, yes, but also uh, in the other role Timothy Oliphant, which I can I can go with mm-hmm. on Twitter. Uh, Black Wolf John Oates said, uh, "The more I think about it, I can see it either as a Jim Thompson novel or maybe Cormac McCarthy." Which um, I, I know Cormac McCarthy absolutely that sort of fits in. Also, I can't remember exactly who said it, but there was an absolutely great suggestion that this needs to be a Coen Brothers movie mm-hmm. of of some kind. And um, Peculiar Mayhem on Twitter. I think said, they recommended. Uh, it being the Cohen brothers. In, I think, I think that post. was her. Yeah. yeah. In another post. And all I could, all I had a screenshot of yeah. was the later <laughs> one. And I'd mentioned doing it in flashbacks. And she said, I've been thinking about your idea of doing it in flashbacks. Opening scene is breakfast at the boarding house. Everything before that takes place in flashback, just as he's doing the deed. Final scenes are everyone putting it together, which I think, mm-hmm. um, I, I think would be, be fun. One of those movies that would reward repeat viewing well she also had did you miss it she also had casting suggestions too because she said um buggy eyes (laughs) that's really mean um he's in all uh, the adam sandler's movie steve buscemi yes yeah why could steve buscemi yes steve buscemi as the as the the manipulator if you will and then i can't remember who she chose for the priest or yeah the priest the the reverend Aaron is looking this up on Twitter on his computer right we'll, now. We'll, we'll edit this probably. <laughs> um, the murderer should be George Clooney. Oh, that's right. I, that's I th- I I enjoy that a lot. Keep Hugh Jackman as the as the as the sheriff. I think you got a golden cast right there. 
Yes. I enjoy it when George Clooney has either the like weirdo goofy role or like the really dark kind of serious role. Like yeah. he when he's just like good guy George Clooney, I'm like, eh, but uh <laughs> Yeah, I, I was what was on on cable the other night we were oh Ocean's Eleven came oh. on. And I remember thinking, like, I like this movie, but George Clooney is bland as hell. Mm-hmm. You know, because he's just sort of like smarmy. Mm-hmm. And and but he's you know, so funny in Men Who Stare at Goats, right? And yeah, when he's, he's been he's, in a few like more serious things, where was that one? He was a uh, was he a hitman in that one movie? I can't remember. Oh yeah, I, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But, but like, oh brother, where art thou? You know, oh yeah, he, he's, yeah, that's yeah, a good perfect, one too. perfect mm-hmm. in that. So mm-hmm. yeah, George Clooney, he can do. Um, he does extremes well. Yes, I, I think it's the the middle stuff. He just sort of goes into because he has such let, like the. I think it's because he has such like the average like. You are just a handsome man. Like it's not anything. Spe- he, he doesn't special have a dis- he's, or like he's not, he's not distinctive. R- dis- that, that's a good yes. Yeah, that's a much better dis- way than saying he doesn't have anything special. <laughs> right. Don't worry, George. I'm sticking up for you out here. You're special. Um, that wasn't how I wanted to say it, George Clooney. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, good good suggestions. Um, I think there needs to be a movie about the uh, the Whitechapel Club. Actually, yeah. I can see a movie about. Let's do this again because um, I'm bad at reading books for this book club thing, and I like talking about movies and actors. So (laughs) yeah, I've been I've been reading nothing but novels for like the last month. I haven't read anything. (laughs) I've been reading too much. So all right, anything else? Nope. I think we can get back to the show. The club came to an end. It lasted only about five years, and its end was due mostly to financial problems. In 1892, they moved from their original spot in the back room of Coaster's Saloon to a new larger place. This is the one that's decorated in, in all of the glory <laughs> that you've heard about. The, gl- the gory glory. Gory glory. Yes. Gory glory. Yes. <laughs> Like most things associated with the club, moving to the new headquarters was a complicated, ritualized event. Um, An announcement in a newspaper read, A chestnut roast will be held at the old club rooms of the Whitechapel Club Saturday, March 5th, 1892, from 919 to midnight. (laughs) Very specific. Yes. Immediately after which the club will take formal possession of its new clubhouse, all in caps. None but members admitted. All members expected. So the members sang songs for three hours and presumably ate chestnuts. Have you ever roasted a chestnut, Aaron? Nope. I have roasted chestnuts for a work function, and I was terrified I was going to burn something down. I remember you telling me about that, and yeah. I, I'm I, I'm sad that I missed it because yeah. it sounds like a real a real happening. I yeah, put an end to that. <laughs> so then at midnight, led by members wearing academic regalia, the members moved into the street, accompanied by a fiddler and someone beating a bass drum. They paraded from Coaster's Saloon to their new headquarters. They set off fireworks and broke a bottle of champagne over the entrance. The new clubhouse was pretty elaborate with a stained glass window over the entryway. It featured a very literary looking raven perched on a pen, new furniture, a Steinway piano and a pipe organ. Members were required to contribute an extra $5 and asked to contribute much more if they could to help pay for the upkeep of the new facilities. Soon, however, the club was running up debts to everyone from the landlord to their liquor supplier. Because I'm assuming they went through a lot of liquor. (laughs) Sounds like it. In 1894, the club folded. Although its corporate charter would remain in effect until 1902 and for some reason would remain listed in official records until a court officially dissolved it in 1921. So we've got this club and it's often called a journalist's club. But what kinds of people were members besides journalists? There's several names that appear in newspaper articles around the country. So what was the background of these people? Most of the members of the Whitechapel Club were general assignment reporters, copy editors, sports writers, cartoonists, and a lot of police reporters because they had all the crime information. So (laughs) you have these police reporters, you know, sort of they like the gory stuff. While the Whitechapel is normally referred to as a journalist club, only about 39 of the 94 people who have ever been identified as members worked for newspapers. Others were judges, lawyers, artists, doctors, businessmen, and government officials, including police captain John Bonfield, who was the commander of the police force at the Haymarket riot. So sort of a very much a, a law and order figure. And it's it's kind of um it's kind of interesting you've got 
you know, doctors, lawyers, judges, police in this club that's glorifying violence and sort of chaotic, chaotic fun. And uh, one writer I read an article by about this said that it, it sort of points up some of the the sort of hypocrisy of the ruling class, like in their official roles as Mm -hmm. newspaper editors and judges saying what's wrong with America is this drunkenness. And and then going (laughs) to the white chapel club and, you know, lounging around under bloody knives mounted on the wall, drinking till five in the morning. Well, they were, they were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males. The drinking, the drinking issues weren't with them. The crime issues weren't with them. Those, those, those immigrants, right. Mm -hmm. And the women and the, yeah, all of that. Yeah. So the club hosted some high-profile guests, including future presidents William McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, At the time of their visits, they were the governors of Ohio and New York, respectively. There was C.G. Perkins, uh, who was a a prominent Chicagoan who was a former president. Um, One of the members who was a secretary and a vice president of the club was Dr. Hugh Blake Williams, who was a noted occultist. It was mentioned in several newspapers. Uh, Gary newspaper man Thomas Cannon was a member. It was the founding president was uh, Charles Seymour from the old Chicago Herald. And numerous sources cite him as being one of the most literarily minded of newspaper writers. He had a reputation for being a very high quality sort of prose craftsman among newspaper writers. And cartoonist, prominent Gilded Age cartoonist Tom Powers was also a member. Yeah. And it makes, uh, you're going to hear a little bit about it in just a second, but when you look at, you know, kind of the, the Gothic ritual that they were going through and some of the reading of the poems we're going to hear about. It makes sense that these people were sort of, you know, as we mentioned, of that more literary bent of, you know, having sort of that background or affinity for for literature, gothic literature, I'd assume a lot of that. Um, But, you know, it, it makes sense that, you know, they might have sort of this artistic interest in something like that, I think. Yeah, it it does make sense. So the Whitechapel Club gained a lot of attention for an unusual funeral that was performed along the shore of Lake Michigan. The story, which appeared in newspapers of the time and later recountings, you know, we found it, you know, mentioned in like the obituaries of some of these members when they passed away. Um, So it it made the rounds and then kind of kept cropping up from time to time. And it's definitely worth retelling here. It's probably one of those things that, you know, ends up going down as the thing the club is most remembered for. So the Times of Munster, Indiana, had an article on December 5th, 1911. And so this was, you know, long after this had happened. I think it was it was in the obituary for Dr. Williams, I believe, where it went into great detail about about this event. And the article read, there are many northeastern Lake County people who remember the weird scene that came to their view one night nearly 20 years ago. And the shock at the news as it sifted into Lake County after the cremation is also remembered. So it reports that from a train emerged a group of men dressed as monks. Six of them carried a coffin and the others had torches. Following were frightened Negro waiters bearing good things to eat and drink, the newspaper said. Um, they went to the old Calumet Gun Club house and then onto the lake shore at Miller Beach. The coffin was placed on a pyre, and the monks danced around it and sang and chanted. The men then departed after midnight. The ceremonies were suggested by Dr. Williams due to his love for Shelley, specifically, um, the article noted. (laughs) And the man who died was one Maurice Allen Collins. He had been in a railroad accident and had been awarded damages. When the money was reduced, he bought a revolver and killed himself. He told Dr. Williams that he wanted to leave his body to the club for dissection or cremation. And so the club actually secured a special train to take them from Miller, Indiana, paid for by James W. Scott, the publisher of the Chicago Herald. An oration was given by Honore J. Jackson, quote, an Indian who took a prominent part in the real rebellion. And uh, the newspaper noted that Collins wore a robe like an ancient Greek. So there are other accounts of this event that make some connections between some of these people and and what was going on here a little bit more clear. We found out that Honore Joseph Jackson, who had been mentioned, was actually the one who introduced the club to Maurice Collins. 
Collins was the president of the Dallas Suicide Club, and he argued publicly for public suicide chambers for people who wanted to end their lives. So clearly Collins also had this interest in death, obsession with death. Yes. (laughs) I read somewhere else, too, very early on when I was researching for this, that he actually left his body sort of to science for study and that the club then negotiated kind of taking the body, you know, paid off people, got, oh, the, okay. got the train and and took him to the beach. And so, That's you know, crazy. Yeah, it's it's a little hard to tell exactly how this went. And perhaps, you know, reading a bunch more articles, we could find all of the tiny pieces <laughs> that fit right. together. But overall, the story is Collins kills himself. And somehow the club ends up with his body. They transport it to the shores of Lake Michigan and have kind of this very macabre um, sort of funeral pyre with poetry readings and orations and all of these things. Yeah. That Weird. Is, that, you can't get away with that today. But no. the, the, what you said about them paying off people and then taking the body after it had been left yeah. to science makes a lot more ma- sense yes. than, yeah, than somebody leaving their body to the club. Which I, I'm yes. not sure that's a thing you could even do in, in the 1890s. No, I mean, by that time, the professionalization of like caring for the dead <laughs> had, yeah. had come about. And so there are rules about things like this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and and before we leave this story, we want to return to the belly dancer, Omin. During her interview, she showed the reporter a vase. It all started with this vase, remember, um, that she always took with her on her travels. She lifted the lid that covered the vase. Inside were ashes. These were the ashes of Collins, who had been burned on the funeral pyre. And so those are the ashes that she held. Um, and we just didn't want to give away that piece of the story earlier. So we came back to the vase. <laughs> it was a thank you they gave her. Um, sort of like her payment was these ashes. And she didn't like them. They freaked her out. But she didn't want to let them out of her sight because she was superstitious. She planned to take the remains to a church in Italy for safekeeping and sort of internment the next time she went to Europe. Why she couldn't find a church in the United States, I am not sure. Probably had to do with her not Japanese but Italian magician lover. Probably. (laughs) So what can we make of the Whitechapel Club? Why did it inspire such attention? And what can it tell us about the 1890s? So this era of club culture that we've been talking about coincided with a rise in professionalism in journalism, with journalist clubs emerging in order for reporters and editors to have, according to historians, a forum for mutual criticism and collegiality. So we talked about the press club of Chicago. That was sort of the gold standard of wealthy sort of networking for uh, for high pay- high-powered newspapermen for that criticism and collegiality. They weren't just newspapermen. Um, like the Whitechapel Club, the press club had people distinguished in literature and music and the stage, you know, all getting together. Um, there was fun involved too, as we saw from the Whitechapel Club, often weird fun. And when you see historians saying these are a forum for mutual criticism and collegiality, I'm not sure how much newspaper criticism took place at the Whitechapel Club, but <laughs> definitely a lot of collegiality. So Lawrence contends that the Whitechapel Club played a significant role in forming the self-image of journalists during the Gilded Age. He says, the Whitechapel boys consciously created the character and image of the reporter of that time, the heavy-drinking, devil-may-care, fast-talking, wise-cracking cynic, out to get the facts, hardened to the tragedy of the facts he found, but ready to piece them together into a story that would read, in quotes, sort of read well, as well as inform. While the Whitechapel died... The image its members forged endured not only in their own minds, but in the values and behavior of journalists for many years after. And when you think about this, when I I read this, I was thinking about there is this sort of pop culture image of Gilded Age and early 20th century newspaper reporters being almost like adventurers in some ways. Um, Mm. Think of people like Jack London uh, out you know, on the frontier writing for newspapers and then writing stories about their adventures as well. And, and sort of this idea that, you know, we are consciously sort of crafting 
I don't want to say a caricature, but almost a caricature of what reporters are. I think it's also interesting that the note about, you know, they've been hardened by the facts because, you know, I mean, clearly they're reporting on a lot of crime and a lot of gritty things at this time. And you mentioned that a lot of the reporters were the police reporters. Right. And so you can kind of almost see that. You know, whether it's creating the caricature of like, yeah, we deal with death all the time. Look at the death on our walls <laughs> right, or right. or if it's almost an outlet for that, like a way to to almost satirize what they're doing. You know, like there's several components there that I think are really interesting. So, sort of like using the, the sort of like dark, grim humor as a, a sort of, you know, release for yeah. like the, the tensions of, of dealing with probably some really horrible things. Yeah. And if it happened on the heels of, you know, the Jack the Ripper crimes, plus then the murder of um, the Dr. Cronin there right. in town. Um, I mean, clearly these were worldwide stories that that captured the attention of people because people have always been interested in crime stories. And it's just the media that keeps growing in its ability to report on it. Oh, this is so gruesome and so awful. These Jack the Ripper things or whatever, like, you know. We mentioned Devil in the White City. You have mm-hmm. the H.H. H. Holmes yeah. murders going yep. on as as well. So yep, really, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a very a very violent time and a, a time when when the media was increasingly large more newspapers in the country than ever um and newspapers tended to be this is the era of the yellow press the, mm-hmm. the newspapers were lurid mm-hmm. and sensationalistic and that mm-hmm. fits right with this increase in awfulness mm-hmm. that was sweeping through society yeah and so the, there's one other point that i think is really interesting um, that I found in an article. Um, it came from the Anaconda Standard in from Anaconda, Montana. It was printed in May 12th, 1891. And it's talking about one of the club members, a Dr. G. Frank Lidston. Um, and he was interviewed and mentioned that he planned to donate several specimens of skulls to the American Medical Association that had been in the possession of the club. The article said... The doctor has a series of specimens illustrative of the aberrant types and asymmetry found in degenerate skulls, and especially those of criminals. These have been selected by non-scientists solely for their morbid and historic interest. So, like, we all we all wanted these skulls, <laughs> not really for science, but we actually, I think they could be useful to you science men. <laughs> Mor- morbid and historic interest. Most of the things I collect are out of, of some sort of morbid or historic interest, right? <laughs> I hope you don't so- have skulls, like, in a drawer. I have to ask the saucer wife about that. <laughs> um, please, please don't. She, she will automatically assume I do right. and, and, and demand I get rid of them. So there's then a list of, of several of these skulls, and um, I'm going to be reading and talking about them in the way that they were printed, which is not at all how we would talk about these not people today. Nope. So just, you know, we're going historical context here, and that is the language we will be using. So there was the skull of a Mongolian named Ah Wun. He was a cigar maker who committed suicide in Chicago. He was engaged to a white girl, and when she lost her, quote, Mongolian affinity and dumped him, he killed himself. He was the first Chinaman to kill himself in America. There was the skull of a Negro known for headbutting anything and not hurting himself. And eventually wow. when he en- dies, I think it was from a stabbing. I, I didn't put this in the notes, but I think he was stabbed and that's how he died in a fight. Um, so, of course, study the skull. There was the skull of a Sioux squaw who was at Wounded Knee. The skull of a half-breed Mexican and Negro. He had an odd-shaped head and was mentally average of the Negro race, but morally he was decidedly degenerated. And then there was Dutch Charlie's skull, a Western criminal and desperado who was lynched. The article then mentions that Dr. Lidston says the club did not want to give up these specimens, but he persuaded the members into doing so. He says that no amount of money would buy the specimens now in the hall of the Whitechapel Club. And... 
I thought this was really interesting when I read this article because I think it really gets to a sort of pseudoscience that was very popular around this time, which is phrenology. And a lot of us have seen the sort of – I think you can buy them sort of as a joke now, yeah. the sort of head model with the different zones of the, mm-hmm. the skull sort of labeled as to, you know, if there's sort of like a bulge in this area, you're, you know, an idiot or, or, or something <laughs> like that or you're a liar or you you have – you know, unclean thoughts, you know, sort of like mapping the skull to determine personality traits and intelligence. And unfortunately, it was used to um, scientifically, um, qu- quotes, scientifically support a lot of racism. And, you know, if we look at the skull shapes of of these different um ethnicities around the globe, you know, we can see th- that these characteristics that white people have made up to assume are parts of of these ethnicities. Um, these can be seen in the shape of the skull. And um, it's very it was used in some very, very dangerous ways, um, gets mixed into a lot of things that Hitler was interested in. Yes, <laughs> and yes. um, you know, we're not going to get into that here, but I, I wrote a paper about phrenology in my modern racism class as an undergrad. So <laughs> there's a there's a book called um, Himmler's Lost Crusade about oh. the Nazi expedition to Tibet to measure the heads, all mm. the heads of people in Tibet to determine, you know, the sort of root race of the mm-hmm. Aryan race and that sort of thing in in the 1930s. And the one about headbutting and not hurting himself just reminded me of this old pro wrestling cliche that you, you should never ever headbutt a Samoan. Uh, Samoans are are completely impervious to headbutts. If a Samoan headbutts you, you're pretty much oh. dead. So yeah, the phrenology is is really amazing. This is sort of as you said, Sam, the, the I don't want to say golden age, but this is the high point of pseudoscientific mm-hmm. racist theory mm-hmm. that would go on for a long time afterwards. Mm-hmm. You can find some of you can find the descendants of some of these theories on various corners of the internet today mm-hmm. being quoted as if their real things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it might not be that, you know, the club, I mean, obviously the doctor is saying that the club didn't select these skulls for those reasons. They just wanted infamous skulls (laughs) for, for their collection. But Dr. Lidston saw the potential scientific value in them and wanted to, to donate them to to the proper medical authorities. I think it's interesting to look at something like the Whitechapel Club. It's such the small blip in history. And when I came across it, I wasn't sure that I would find that much in the newspapers about it. But then we found lots of stuff, uh, which is which is really great. But I think you can take something like this and from it learn about so many different things, not just but what the Whitechapel Club did at a meeting or how they decorated their things or that they had this weird funeral pyre. But, you know, once you dig beyond the the funny stories or the reporting of weird events or whatever, um, there's there's stuff to be to be taken away from it. And I think that this is a case that proves that. I, I think it, it does show some of the uh, the development of journalism in mm-hmm. in America and the, that professionalization i found that that very interesting and i think it piggybacks really well off of our last episode too about the rattle run murders yes. because there we were talking about like you know this idea that in the past people weren't so violent or grim or whatever but like no these guys are obsessed with death and murder and not only the people in this club but the stories became so popular and you can see how quickly you know the the one that i mentioned um well several of these you know end up very quickly being dispersed to media outlets throughout the country as well and people were just eating this stuff up you know i'm sure that they you know couldn't get enough of reading about the weird club named after jack the ripper's stomping grounds that had you know souvenirs from crimes from across the globe adorning the walls <laughs> right and so yeah. we've all people have always been interested in creepy weird sometimes true crime like all all of that the morbid things fits into the story of this club and it was happening in the early 1890s among business class dudes <laughs> yes and and judges yes. and police captains yes. and, and prominent. high up people, prominent yep. people. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have anything else? I do not. All right. Thanks for listening. The Whitechapel Club was written and produced by Samantha Engel and Aaron Gullius. Our music is by Raphael Crux. Great Lakes Lore is a Chizo Media production. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, don't get lost in the lore. <laughs>